Return to the Word is made possible by faithful supporters like you. Find out more at returntotheword.com. Welcome to another edition of Return to the Word Radio with Bible teacher Mark Fontecchio. Advancing the message of God's amazing grace through the teaching of God's Word. And now with today's message, here is our teacher. When Charles Haddon Spurgeon first served at Park Street Church in London, he was known as the Boy Preacher. By the time he was just 20 years old, he had preached more than 500 times. And by 1853, he was the pastor of Park Street Church. Now, the church itself, at the time, it actually had a seating capacity of 1,500 people. But the church attendance was averaging under 200. In nine years' time, they had outgrown the church, and the Metropolitan Tabernacle was built to accommodate the large crowds that gathered. Now, Spurgeon's sermons were published, of course, in newspapers around the world. A school was built up and established to train pastors. Evangelistic books were printed. It's estimated that over 23,000 people heard him preach during those years. For 38 years, Spurgeon was the pastor of Metropolitan Tabernacle. 14,000 members joined the church. And at his death in 1892, over 100,000 people lined the streets of the funeral parade. It's hard to put into words the impact that this man, that this church had upon London. But jump forward in time to the early 1970s. This same church was down to such a small group, they only took up a few pews in the front of the church in the Sunday morning service. What happened over all that time? This church, at one point, was a center for the gospel of Jesus Christ, a center for the teaching of the Word of God. But what happened? Well, many explanations could be given. London had certainly changed. Wars came and went. The people had changed. All these things are absolutely true. But at its most basic level, somewhere along the way, the church lost its focus. Sure, I'll give them this. When a fire came in 1898, they rebuilt And yes, when it was bombed in 1941, that can put a cramp in your style when the Nazis come and bomb your church. But when it was bombed in World War II, again, they rebuilt. But the building was not the church. And as they lost their focus, they became insignificant in the eyes of many. And that is the central core of the message that we see in Stephen's message to the Sanhedrin. Where does God live? Where does God work? He lives and he works in the lives of his people. Not too long ago, they conducted a survey of people from 1,000 churches. And they asked what these people thought was the mission of the church of Jesus Christ. A staggering 89% said that the church exists to take care of my needs. To take care of me. Only 11% thought it had anything to do at all with sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. The world today does not fear the church It barely tolerates it, if it will. It considers the church a relic from the distant past, a holdover, if you will, from bygone days. Big but harmless, kind of like a beached whale. Because the church, the church has lost its focus. And why? Well, traditions, buildings, programs... All these things have become the focus. Instead of the gospel of Jesus Christ, instead of loving people, instead of worship of God, and line upon line study of God's Word. 
Stephen's message to the Sanhedrin, it stands as a rebuke to the leaders then, and it stands as a rebuke to the church at large today. Let's take a look. Because in his defense, Stephen, he actually gives us a masterful theological discourse on the very presence of God. Stephen, in his defense, he had told them, we don't need the temple sacrifices anymore. And so the temple, it's actually redundant. Stephen had been going around, if you remember, around Jerusalem, arguing that Jesus is actually greater than the building. Jesus is greater than this temple structure. Jesus is greater than religion of man. And honestly, I believe, friends, if Stephen was standing right here, right now, today... I'm confident that he would remind us that this wonderful building that we have, it's not the house of God. It's not. It's a place of worship, but it cannot contain God. And that very teaching, that simple teaching right there, that is what got Stephen stoned to death. Now, Stephen, he didn't back down on this important topic. He never compromised, and he never sought to please men instead of Christ. In our last verse, in verse 37, we saw that Stephen reminded the men of the words of Moses. Moses had predicted the coming of the Messiah. Verse 38. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai. And with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us. Moses was with the people in the wilderness. Now, on Wednesday night, we had a fascinating study on this very subject. We talked about this, that the Old Testament, it makes reference to the angel of the Lord. And that's kind of what Stephen is driving at here. And it's a reference, if you will, to the pre-incarnate, the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, let's say it a little more simpler. It was Christ who spoke to the fathers of Israel. It was Christ who spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. The Apostle Paul, if you remember, he wrote in Colossians 1 that Christ is the creator of all things. Christ is the image of the invisible God. Christ is preeminent in everything. So it shouldn't surprise us that Stephen teaches it was the pre-incarnate Christ that spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. Now Galatians 3.19, if you're keeping score, read. Galatians 3.19, it does teach that angels were present at the giving of the Mosaic Law. And we're going to see this again in verse 53. But in verse 35 and in verse 38, the angel that spoke here is that appeared to Moses in the bush. This was the angel of the Lord. It was Christ. Notice the end of verse 38, still speaking here of Moses, the one who received the living oracles to give to us. This is a powerful statement. We miss the power of this statement because we're so used to having so many Bibles at our disposal. The living oracles of God. This is why we study the Word of God. 1 Peter chapter 1, the Apostle Peter, he told us that the Word of God lives and abides forever. Hebrews 4.12, most of you should know. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You know, Israel, they had the Scriptures. They had the Scriptures that were written with the finger of God, written on the tablets of stone. The inspired written word of God. It came from the one who had now become the incarnate word. Now verse 39, Stephen makes an amazing statement. Watch what he says. Whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. First in verse 27, we have seen before that it was just the one Hebrew man in Egypt who said to Moses... Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? But now, now it was a bigger problem. Now it was the nation. Now all the people were rejecting him. So follow this progression in the verses. Stephen referred to the living oracles. 
Moses received the word of God on Mount Sinai. And while he was up on the mount, what were God's people doing down below? They weren't worshiping God. They turned their hearts back to Egypt. You see, this has always been the problem with God's people. A lack of simple obedience to the word of God. Pride sets in. Or sometimes it's just because we feel like taking the easiest path in life. For the Hebrew people, their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. The Hebrew people, they had such a a long history of rebellion against God. Here's what they said in Exodus 32. Notice this. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, what has he done for us lately, really, is what they said. What has he done lately? We don't know what has become of him. Where did he go? Think of the image. God had led these people out of Egypt. God had sovereignly led these people out of Egypt. And Moses was actually talking with God up on the mountain. And in their hearts, what did they want? They wanted to go back. They wanted to go back. That's where sin starts, doesn't it? That is where sin starts. Sin comes from within. They were a people without homes. Without the basic provisions of life. Hey, at least in Egypt they had those things. They reasoned in their mind that it was better to be pagan back in the land of Egypt, if you will, and have a warm bowl of stew than it was to follow God in the desert. You know, they whined about this. They whined and whined and whined about this all throughout their journey. In Numbers 11, they said, We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons. Cucumbers are good. I'm not so sure about the melons. The leeks, the onions, and the garlic. Food. They liked it. The people said to Aaron... In verse 40 of our text in Acts, notice again, Make us gods to go before us, for as for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. This is Exodus 32.1. Be amazed at how much Stephen knew the word of God. Listen, the Jewish people later became so repulsed at the thought of the golden calf They were embarrassed by this, being made at the base of Mount Sinai, that they referred to it as the unspeakable deed. The rabbis in the first century, they wouldn't even talk about it. They didn't want it even brought up in their synagogues. But Stephen did. He pressed it further in verse 41, reminding them, and they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. They were impatient. Being impatient led to worship of a golden calf. A golden calf because in Egypt the sacred bull was one of their gods. This was a deliberate turn, if you will, back to the gods of Egypt. The creator of the universe, the creator of everything is up there on the mountain giving Moses the word of God and the people are down below making an idol. I heard a story about a man who had purchased a very expensive painting and it came in this large frame and he took it home and he began to do exactly what we still do to this day. He began to look around and figure out where is he going to put this thing. Each wall he had, they just seemed too small for its size, for its presence. And finally he went back to the artist. And the artist told him that when he hung a painting, he did it a little bit different. The very first thing that he did was empty out the room. He took out all the decorations and all the furniture. And then he hung it on a wall and arranged the furniture in the room around the picture. This way, the picture is not just prominent, it's preeminent. It's the center of the focus. Listen, that's what God is saying. He doesn't want his people just to make room for him. He doesn't want us to tack it on at the end of the day like one more thing we have to do. He wants to be the center of our lives. And I think that was the problem back then for the Hebrew people. They made room for God. But he wasn't the center. 
And so even though God had brought them out of the land of the Egyptians, they made an Egyptian idol and worshipped it as the author of their salvation. Look again at the end of verse 41. They rejoiced in the works of their own hands. This is always the problem of man. We like to do something to try to earn that favor with God. We really like that. We're kind of addicted to trying to earn favor with God. And we like to worship the things that we make. Look at my house. Look at my boat. Look at what I made. We do that as people. The things we build instead of God. And that was the heart of the issue. The temple had become an idol for the Sanhedrin. That's what Stephen is saying. And so let's be careful we don't do that. We don't do that same thing. Stephen was being accused of speaking against the temple. And he doubled down. And he told them not to make an idol of it. Difficult words to hear come in verse 42. Notice, then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. This is really the same teaching, if you will, as that of Romans 1. God allowing men to follow their sinful hearts, allowing men to follow the cravings of sin, worshiping the creation instead of the creator. But why would the Hebrew people worship the heavens, the things in the sky? Again, the Egyptian gods were tied to the stars, the constellations in the night sky. They represented gods to the Egyptians. The Milky Way was said to be the sky goddess giving birth to the sun god. To worship the stars was actually to return to the gods of Egypt. Pick up your text with me in Acts with the second half of verse 42 again. As it is written in the book of the prophets, did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Notice the reference in verse 42 to the book of the prophets. Now, what is that? Well, that's the Hebrew Scriptures. The Hebrew Scriptures has all 12 of the minor prophets as one book. One book, known as the Book of the Twelve. That's what Stephen is referring to here. When he mentioned the Book of the Prophets, Stephen is quoting from the Book of Amos, where God actually specifically asked the question, did Israel offer sacrifices to him when they wandered in the desert? What's the purpose? Why is this here? We'll stick with it. They went through the motions. Sure they did. They went through those outward motions of worshiping God. But they also worshiped other gods. To worship Moloch was some sick, sick, disgusting stuff. You would worship Saturn and the stars and it carried over into the sacrifices of children. This was an abomination to God. Moloch was the god of wealth and prosperity. Parents would actually offer their firstborn child and watch them die, can you imagine? Believing their families would benefit by the sacrifice of their child. Remphan also was tied to the worship of Saturn and to the Egyptians. This idol worship, it started in the wilderness for them. And it would eventually lead to God allowing the people to be carried off into exile. Now, there is, again, if you're keeping score and tracking, there's one minor difference we see between Amos and Stephen's quote. Amos was actually prophesying to the northern tribe. So Amos reads beyond Damascus. Stephen was standing before the descendants of the southern tribes. And so instead of saying beyond Damascus, he just changes a little bit and told them beyond Babylon at the end of verse 43. Not too long ago, a mother had her babysitter cancel. So she had to bring her four-year-old little son to the women's Bible study with her. And the kid, he played nicely, and he kind of listened in a little bit. And they were in the Gospels, and he just listened, but he played with his toys. And when they were walking to the car, he said to her, Mom, I'm not going to sin anymore. That's pretty good. 
A little surprised by this, she asked him, wanting to know what had inspired such a bold statement. And here was his answer. Jesus said, if you don't sin, you can throw the first stone. (laughs) And I want to throw the first stone. Well, the Sanhedrin, they thought that they were in a good spot at this point in the text. To be able to accuse Stephen of sin. In fact, they were getting the stones ready for his execution. Yes, they were. We can be sure that Stephen understood the danger. We can be sure of that. But he continued to turn the charges back on them. And so what he does in verses 44 through 46 is tell them that no matter how glorious the tabernacle of God truly was, it was for a limited time. It was for a limited purpose. And one day it would be replaced by something better. Now, when in the wilderness, go back in your mind if you would, when in the wilderness, the house of worship for Israel was a tabernacle of witness. The tabernacle was a witness of the God of the Hebrew people. It was in the tabernacle that the ark was kept, which contained these very stone tablets of the law. Now, the tabernacle itself was made according to those precise guidelines that you see that God put forth in the book of Exodus. Very specific. And the tabernacle continued to remain to be the place of worship even after the conquest of Joshua, after they went into the promised land. It remained in the land. It passed down from generation to generation until the time of David. God even said to Nathan in 2 Samuel, 7, for I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought up the children up out of Israel, out of from Egypt, even to this day, but have moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. Notice this next part. Wherever I have moved about with all the children of Israel, have I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? You see, David wanted the temple. And it would happen in God's time. Solomon would build it, Stephen tells us in verse 47. But the temple, it actually brought about more problems because then the building became the object of worship instead of the Lord himself. Churches. Churches fall into this trap instead of making the focus on the work of God in their lives. All too often, the discussion in many churches is on the buildings and the things that they can contain instead of the work of God in our lives. So watch the rebuke. Now it heats up here. Watch the rebuke that comes in verse 48. The Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. And Stephen quotes Isaiah 66 to prove his point of the foolishness of men trying to build a house for the God who has created all things. Read it with me. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? It's not that buildings don't have a place because they do. It's not that it was wrong to worship at the temple, but here was the difference. When it started out, God gave the instructions for the tabernacle to be a place where God himself could actually be worshipped. Not that God was limited to the tabernacle, but God could be worshipped there. But now with the temple, the Jews had gone further and further, thinking that God was limited to working in this one building built by men. Stephen He was a Hellenist Jew. Here was a guy who spent most of his life worshiping God outside of Jerusalem. Stephen understood that God cannot be defined. God cannot be explained by a building that is made with hands. From our limited understanding, there's nothing. There's nothing that we can build that expresses who God is. The connection here that Stephen was making was just as Israel had worshipped the golden calf, now they worshipped the temple instead of God. And here is the danger. When a place of worship becomes a representation for God himself, it becomes a substitute. The building becomes a substitute for a living relationship with God. That's what he's after. Stephen was showing us that the history of how God dealt with Israel, it puts it out there that God cannot and will not be confined to one building in one location. 
In 1 Kings chapter 8, at the dedication of the temple, Solomon, Solomon himself, he prayed to the Lord and he said this, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. Solomon said this. What need does the eternal and infinite God have of a temple? What are the buildings for? The buildings are for man. The buildings are for us, giving us a place to meet, a place to worship. But may they never become the focus. Now, the most tragic part about this is that for many of the Jewish people, the temple was all they knew about God. It stood as a monument to the past glory of God. Everything they believed about God was contained within the safe walls of the temple. It spoke of history, power, prestige, tradition. They felt safe in their temple, just like we feel safe in our church building. They didn't want to be stretched in their faith. Their faith, if you think about it, it didn't go beyond the confines of the temple courts. They thought that they had to protect their temple, protect God from what others might do to his house. They had lost their focus of why the temple was built in the first place. Their history, their traditions had gotten in the way. So here comes the hammer. There's no other way to say it, Reed. Here comes the hammer in our last three verses. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised... I didn't say this. This is God. (laughs) Through Stephen. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Strong words. There's no doubt about that. Strong, strong words. Stiff-necked, meaning stubborn. Uncircumcised in heart and ears, meaning God had not pierced their hearts. These were dead men, men without faith in Christ, living in disobedience to God. Their man-centered religion resisted the work of God just like their fathers had done. Look again at the statement at the beginning of verse 52. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? You know, being an Old Testament prophet is kind of, they used to have that show on dirty jobs. It kind of was a dirty job. It meant that you had to speak out against sin when things were going wrong. Persecution kind of came with the job. In Exodus 17, Moses, you remember, he was almost stoned. Tradition teaches us that Isaiah, he was put into a hollow tree and cut into two. Elijah would have been executed if Jezebel could have laid hands on him. Jeremiah was told by God not to get married. Why? Because no woman should have to suffer uh, suffer as much as he was about to suffer. And after being hauled off to Egypt by the apostate Jews, Jeremiah was stoned to death. Zechariah, he was martyred between the temple and the altar. But all these crimes against the prophets, the messengers of God, they didn't even compare to what the Sanhedrin had done. They murdered the just one. They murdered the Christ. Now, the Jewish leaders had turned their backs on God. They had betrayed the Christ, and they stood guilty of murder. And the Sanhedrin accused Stephen of speaking against the law, against Moses, and against the temple. Stephen responds by telling them they stood guilty of murder, opposing God, and breaking the very laws of God. Jacob Brodsky, not a name that you would know, but young Jacob was a Jew from Russia, and his father, he owned a bookstore. And his father desperately wanted his son to go off to college. But Jacob didn't. He had a girl on his mind, a girl named Lila. Now, Lila was a beautiful French girl with great ambitions in life. So when his father died, Jacob dropped out of college and he married Lila. And Jacob took over the bookstore and they lived above it and Jacob he just loved books he just loved to read and he loved the simple little life that he had carved out for themselves but Lila oh she was looking for something more 
And when the offer came for her to sing in the theater and go on tour in Europe, she grabbed it. She took it. Jacob was devastated by this. But when she left, he reached into his pocket and handed her the key to the front door. Now, he predicted that she'd come back and that he'd be waiting there for her. Well, Jacob, he turned to books and he began to withdraw from a normal life. He kept to himself and most often you'd find him in the back at a large desk in the back of the bookstore, reading books and waiting for the love of his life to return. Fifteen years went by. Fifteen years. And then one day Lila did return. And when Jacob got up and rose up from the desk to help her, he didn't act like the love of his life had just walked through the door. He saw her as a customer, asking if he could help her find a book. Well, a little hurt by this, Lila had an idea. She told him about a book that she was looking for. It told the story of a young couple in love, living above a bookstore. The young wife left to pursue a career, but she could never let go of that key that her husband had given to her. But even this did little. And Lila slowly realized that he had lost touch with his heart's desire. They had no longer even knew the purpose of why he had been sitting there for 15 years waiting. With one last effort, Lila said to him, You remember it. You must remember it. The story of Lila and Jacob. And he paused and just said, There's something familiar about that story. I think I've read it somewhere. You see, Jacob had actually waited so long. Jacob had been reading so many stories and so many books by men. He had forgotten his passion. He had forgotten the one that he loved. So she dropped the key. She walked out the door. And Jacob just went back to reading. Not even knowing the one he had waited for so long had come and gone. Stephen, he'd been reminding the Jews of their history with the living God. Because what had started out as a relationship based on love had become just another part of their traditions and their laws. And they honestly didn't know that the Messiah had come and they had crucified him and he was gone. Where does God live? Stephen argues that God cannot be limited to just one location. And that the power of God cannot be contained to anything built with human hands. God lives here. He lives within his people because the Son of Man, Jesus the Christ, has opened up for a way to us, have direct, for us to have direct access to God that is more immediate and more satisfying than a temple could ever provide. You know, we don't have to come to a building to worship God. We don't have to come to a building to pray or gain atonement for our sins. The church is quite simply where believers have chosen to gather. Paul, writing to believers, said it like this, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? And again, in chapter 6 of that same letter, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? You are bought at a price, he goes on to say. So what makes a place the temple of God? Spirit of God. God met with believers before the temple. God meets with believers even now. We as believers have full and immediate access to God. And here is where this truth hits home. Wherever there are believers in Jesus Christ, there exists the church of Christ. His church is not a building, a cathedral, but here because of us and because of him. And so what this means, and here comes the application, is that the desecration of the church is not when someone comes by and shoots paintballs at the side of our church building. It's not when someone comes and vandalizes the building. Desecration of the church, hear me on this, is the sin that we harbor in our hearts. In other words, let me tell it to you this way. If you want to respect the church of Jesus Christ, it's not just behaving the right way here in this building and in this room. That's not respecting the church. Respecting the church is overcoming the sin in your life and walking in love toward one another in the body of Christ. Walking in love with the Savior. 
And we're going to see next week that that's what put the Sanhedrin right over the edge. It wasn't anything about the temple. It's a statement that Stephen is about to make in verse 56, that he saw the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. This isn't all about the temple, and it's not all about Stephen. It's about the reality of who Jesus Christ is. So that's what the book of Acts is about. It's about Christ. It's about who he is. And the same should be true about our lives, friends. Our lives should be about proclaiming the reality of Christ. Live it out for the glory of God. Live it out, not because you have to, but because of his love. Knowing that the words of Colossians 3 to be true, that when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Amen. Return to the Word is a listener-supported ministry. And truthfully, it is people like you, those who listen each week, that God uses to help us meet the expense of a ministry dedicated to reaching people for the gospel of Christ and the teaching of God's Word. And so I want to take a moment to thank those that support the work, even those that give $5 a month or $10 a month, because those smaller donations, they add up. And we thank you because it keeps the programs free of charge so that others may learn of God's amazing grace. If you'd like to help us out, you can find out more at returntotheword.com. Return to the Word Ministries is committed to teaching the full counsel of God's Word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. For more about our ministry, please visit returntotheword.com. Return to the Word is a faith ministry. This means we freely distribute the teaching of the Word of God over the air and online. We do this without charge. If you feel led to support the ministry with a donation to help cover these costs, you may do so on our website, returntotheword.com, or by mailing a donation to Return to the Word, P.O. Box 879259, Wasilla, Alaska, 99687. Thanks for listening, and we pray that the Word of God will be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Join us next time for another edition of Return to the Word.